Um, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm really excited about this presentation. Uh, what more can I do an exploration of critical advocacy research and decision points towards culturally responsive research uh, with Dr. Penny Pasque, which um, I will uh, be introducing in a second. Just to go over some of the GoTo webinar features, feel free to type in a question at any time in the question area. We'll be taking questions um, uh, at the end. Uh, there's also the handout of the PowerPoint slides um, Penny will be, be showing today, so feel free to download those. Uh, this is being recorded, and you'll get a recording um, and probably sometime next week uh, in an email from us. So I will get started. Uh, so my name is Stacey Penna. I'm the NVivo Community Director here at QSR International. I'll talk a little, little bit more about the community at the end. And I also want to introduce um, or have um, Allie introduce herself. Yes. Hi, everyone. I'm Ali Owen. I'm a commissioning editor for Research Methods Books at SAGE via their London office. And I, too, am really excited for this series and thrilled to be here kicking it off with Penny. Yes, and it's been great um, working with Ali in this partnership to bring these webinars to you. Uh, so our presenter today is Dr. Penny Pasque, uh, Professor in Educational Studies and Director of Qualitative Methods and the Qual Lab for the College of Education and Human Ecology at The Ohio State University. Um, Penny is also an editor of the Review of Higher Education, one of the leading research journals in the field. Her research addresses complexities and in qualitative inquiry in equities in higher education and disconnections between higher education and society. She works with um, and studies qualitative met methodologies and that work towards social justice and educational equity. So welcome, Penny. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much, Stacy. I'm going to make you presenter now so you can control the slides. All right. Perfect. Thank you so much. I'm gonna. Uh, I'm showing my screen, right? And yes. Um, you. It's. Um, you might. Might. Yeah. If you. Yes. We can see the PowerPoint perfectly, and you. Oh, perfect. Thank you so much. Thanks for the nice introduction and for kicking off this series. I appreciate it. As Stacy mentioned, I'm the professor and director of the Qual Lab. So I have our follow us on Twitter, all that good stuff at the bottom. And of course, during this presentation, feel free to tweet out. But I wanted to start by saying thank you to Stacy and Allie for this series, because I think right now in particular, we're living through multiple pandemics. I just want to mention just Tuesday in the United States in Atlanta, there were eight women who were murdered by a white man, six of whom identify as Asian or Asian American. And these murders come at a time when a the Asian community in the United States has really faced terror and violence with COVID. And I know also with the Black Lives Matter movement and the violence around Black lives, not just in the United States, again, it could be all over the globe that people have been uh, protesting and, uh, act and very active. And I think with all of these, your research matters. Our research makes a difference. And so I'm excited to engage with you today about how to think about critical advocacy research and your decisions as researchers. And so I also want to start with a land acknowledgement. I come to you from Central Ohio, where I recognize it is the traditional homeland of the Shawnee, Miami, and Wyandotte, as well as other indigenous nations. And there's been a long tradition of harmful and violent research on Native communities. And I think it's important to us to make sure that our research does more than just do no harm, as is our IRB requirement. How do we really think about the standpoint and working in community with, as opposed to on or for different communities? So I think that that is just important to note as we start here today. So what more can I do? An exploration of critical advocacy research and decision points toward culturally responsive research. I think of it as you, me, we together, how to continue to push the envelope on some of this work. You've probably seen the abstract. That's why you came today. So thank you for coming today. But let me highlight a few things. It, 
that today's conversation is about making change toward more racially and equitable just society and really using critical advocacy research to address and go beyond just documenting issues of oppression and hegemonic power, but really to make change and be an advocate and support voices. This is a bit different than how we may have been trained about objectivity and dominant ways of thinking, right? So I know that this is an intentional shift and I'm being very clear and naming that with you here today. So what are we gonna talk about today? We'll go through an overview about what critical advocacy is. I will also talk through decision-making in terms of data collection, analysis, about actual dissemination, call to action and change, additional comments and, and uh, concepts as well. And hopefully we'll have plenty of time for a conversation at the end. So I'm gonna start with Dr. Leslie Gonzalez and her research about how we tend to stick with what we were trained and maybe adjust it slightly as we move through our faculty careers. So this can be problematic. I'm working with Leslie on an, an in vivo project using in vivo with a systematic literature review uh, and really working up on what are the ways in which epistemic injustice and dominant paradigms really get perpetuated in graduate programs. I think I should also be really clear, make no mistake, positivism is the dominant research paradigm. It is linked to your tenure and promotion, whether you finish your dissertation or not, journal publications, it is absolutely a certain, there's a standard out there that I think it's important to know understand, understand how that operates, and then decide if you take an approach that deviates from that and actually pushes against that. And so uh, I think really interrogating that is important. And so your research makes a difference in order, it's a new world that we're living in. So what are the different methodologies that we can utilize that might change how research is done and really push the field? So. I'm looking forward to, to our conversation. What is culturally responsive research? Well, here are references throughout this PowerPoint. It really is about paying attention to culture and the cultural standpoint of people who are doing the research, the research, really taking it through the entire research design. That's what we'll focus on today, all those decisions. In addition, I think it's important to pay attention to culture, the intersections of culture, paying attention to race, naming issues of race, white supremacy, ethnicity, citizenship, gender and gender identity, class, sexual orientation, religion, age, all the identities that are out there, as well as intersectionality, the ways in which these pieces operate together and simultaneously. So, Critical advocacy research really centers a commitment to equity and social justice. Rosanna and I have done some work on this. And it also, I think it's important to say, you can pick up a critical emancipatory topic. You can do research with native students on campus. You can do research with uh, black members of the community and Black Lives Matter movement, movements. But if you, part of critical advocacy research is really taking a critical advocacy approach in the research design as well, not just in the topic, but with your decisions for collection, for analysis, for dissemination with community members, coming up with your research question with community members. That is really what makes the difference here and what's a little, little bit different than maybe some of the ways we've been trained. It also, again, takes it through the entire research process, and you'll notice I'm saying uh, data analysis in quotes here because I feel like it's such a reductive term. Much of the work we do goes beyond data. And I'm going to offer options in terms of how do you do this work? We often say it, it sounds wonderful, I'm on board, but then give me the tangibles. How do I actually do this in my own research, especially when you, you're not necessarily supported for that or get trained in how to do this? So 
many of us have been trained in the very familiar John Cresswell uh, five parts of a research study where the hourglass kind of comes down to your research question, your research question drives everything, and your findings discussion flow from there, right? I want to uh, mentioned that I've worked with my colleagues in Kakali Bachataria. There are many people who talk about research as iterative. Qualitative really is iterative. Maybe you'll start with an orienting research question. Maybe your community partners have a research question. How do you really think about the fluid nature of qualitative and how it folds back on it as you go through the process? So this is what I've designed. I have a book proposal in process, and I really have developed it working with students having taught qualitative for 12 years. And so I think students are, are visual and it really helps to kind of put all this together. However, I have to say it's very reductive. I acknowledge that, know that it's very reductive. But what I do with students is say, this week, we're gonna talk about decision points for data collection. Now, this week, we're going to talk about data analysis and in vivo. And here's where in vivo fits in the larger focus of qualitative research. And that visual kind of helps situate that particular lesson on in vivo and how to figure out how to do nodes and all that within the larger frame of a qualitative study. What is qualitative or critical advocacy inquiry? What is it? It really is a multifaceted research paradigm that is a collection of ontologies, epistemologies, methodologies, axiologies, praxeologies, and it's about overturning injustice. So when what might be new to you is critical scholars have taken axiology where praxeology is often embedded in the ethics and dissemination. And many critical scholars have said, wait a minute, that's not happening. We are thinking about ethics and axiology, but we're not actually putting it into practice. We're not changing policy, getting it to legislators. We're not put changing programs. We need to actually talk about praxeology separately to highlight it and center it. I also want to name that most researchers, myself included, as a full professor, it's a location of power and privilege. And so that makes a difference when you're really working with issues of inequity and disparity and how to overturn, right? So knowing and understanding power and privilege and how that comes into play for you matters. So back to this. Uh, picture and this uh, paradigmatic uh, research design. I, I want to also name that Foucault and others have said that one of your decisions in your research is not necessarily your epistemological, ontological, axiological approach, that you can't necessarily pick your lens or your approach because that is ingrained with who you are. You actually live and breathe this, uh, your being, and that determines your epistemological or your lens or paradigmatic approach, right? That's that's a whole argument we're not going to necessarily get into, but I do want to name that because I think there's a lot of scholars who will say, hey, I'm going to do a pragmatic study. And then later, oh, this one is post-structural. And let me draw from there. The argument is that you're reducing things to methods, that really it's not a change in your paradigmatic approach. It's a change in your methods. But who you are hasn't changed. The argument is that, and I don't use this lightly, that you will literally drive yourself crazy if you go from one paradigmatic approach to another, that that is ingrained, again, in who you are, your lived experience and who, you, uh, how you live and breathe. So not necessarily a decision point that we're going to talk about here today, but I'll show you how I did use it in a study. So tangible examples for you or to do or to continue to disrupt, interrupt, overturn, and reimagine. I want to make sure that we talk about how to do this. So 
Borderlands, Matisse de He Feminism. I really appreciate Cynthia Savager's work and some of the work that she's really done with this, where right away you're flipping what we know about research. You're starting with the community. Your research questions are coming from the community, from engaging with people. And that's what sets the tone for the all of the research, not you sitting in an ivory tower with your grad students, as happens, you know, so often. It's, again, how we were trained. But BF, BMF is accessible. It uproots dualistic thinking. You'll see here that it's an epistemology, a methodology, and a tool for collection and analysis. It's a bridge in between theories and methodologies. They connect these together. Again, it's not linear. It is embodied. Who Ellen and Cynthia are as embodied people come through in this approach. So a good example that I hope you actually take a look at this SAGE uh, handbook that many of you probably see quite often and take a look at their work and utilize their work in your future research studies. More tangible examples. Some of the work that I did with the National Forum on Higher Ed for the Public Good at the University of Michigan has really worked with communities. Their work with Detroit's Hope Village is one that's an example where they paid community members to learn how to be researchers and then do the research in conjunction with the scholars at the university. So community members are getting paid and trained up in this project and approach. Another piece by um, Kimberly, Aurora, and Kyle about undocumented student access, and then I have one about community engagement and some of the trust issues that are really hard to overcome in terms of universities relationships with communities. So decision points, let's talk a little bit um, about methodological perspectives and how do you actually do this in a study? So I'm putting up here on the PowerPoint a list of methodological approaches and it is not exhaustive. You're probably looking at this list right now going, oh, but mine is not up there. The one that I is my go-to that I love is not up there. You're right. There are so many methodological perspectives. We tend to pick one and then kind of stick with what we know or how we were trained. And so let's just take one. Let's just take grounded theory, for example, and pop it or put it on, layer it on this very false continuum of qualitative paradigms, right? So again, false continuum, but if you build this out and start to think about post-positivist grounded theory with Strauss and Corbin uh, that they worked on methods, open coding, axial coding, select coding, right? Then Kathy Charmaz, some of you may know her, comes along and she studies with them and then says, wait a minute, but I'm a constructivist. I believe that the researcher makes a difference, that the researcher is the instrument. I can't do it your way. My paradigmatic approach is so different. So her book, Constructivist Grounded Theory, talks about the methods and the ways in which you can do a grounded theory from that approach. Along comes Adele Clark, who really picks up a postmodern approach to grounded theory with situational analysis. And we'll talk about some of her work in a little bit as an example. So from that, your methods drop down, your actual findings, and your dissemination, and making sure that your implications and disseminations are going back to communities and making a difference. So we'll talk about that in a little bit as well. So let's do the same with phenomenology, right? Drops down, transcendental phenomenology, so lockstep, very post-positivist. Whereas existential phenomenology, queer phenomenology, there's some work by Mark Bagel that's um, pretty new and innovative as well. Very different paradigmatic approach, which means that, which means that your methods matter. I think Phenomenology is hard because it's a theory and a methodology all at once, right? It gets, I think, um, confusing for some students, but there's a lot in terms of unpacking this methodological approach. And again, congruently, your methods 
drop down from that. And part of why I say this is because if your research is not rigorous, quote unquote rigorous, right? It means something different for every approach, what that rigor is. And so if you're being judged by people in a post-positivist or positivist paradigm, how do you make sure that it's very clear to them that the rigor is there? It just means something very different when you come from a critical or postmodern approach. Case study, same thing, drops down. Uh, somebody like steak, some people say, oh, you know, it's so post-positivist. Other people, no, it's constructivist. It's not this linear, but it gives people an idea about how it will make a difference. And again, with a critical approach, you want to make sure that the implications and dissemination go back to people. All right, I'm gonna take a drink. I want to share with you a tangible example of walking this through with an indigenous case study that I've worked on with a Red Dirt research team so that we're taking this another step and putting it into practice, talking about the how do you actually do this. So I work with this, the Red Dirt research team, and I usually just present when I'm with my colleagues. Uh, so Corey Still, Brianna Ferris, and Monty Begay and I have worked on a Red Dirt research team for a while and are have some pieces in process. And so at what we have done is really drawn from Sean Wilson's work about uh, indigenous research methods. And here, this is a great example. It's not linear. Epistemology, ontology, the being of, the methodology, it's all connected. He also speaks to his son as he's educating scholars throughout this book. It's a really good example of an indigenous approach to scholarship. So for our Red Dirt research team, we're picking indigenous critical case study. And so as we went forward to do a case study on university organizations, and our study was on the ways in which the university presidents are utilizing language and policies and approaches that are oppressive to native students. And so yes, students' voices and experiences are there, but we implicate the organization in this study. And so what we we needed an approach and there's no critical case study. What? There's definitely no indigenous case study that we could find. If you know of any, please send it my way. But so what we what I did find was one piece from Ivana Lincoln from the 80s that was mentioning critical case studies. So I appreciate that from her. We moved forward and we uh, really had to develop what this means to have a critical indigenous case study. So here, a lot of data that we collected as well as interviews. In addition, we drew from Margaret Kovach with her auto narrative sharing circles where we all had sharing circles and we considered Iris, Iris Young has five faces of oppression and the ways in which each one of those phases of oppression were showing up for us. Me as a white Sicilian Italian scholar, or that explains probably why my hands are moving around. Um, and for each one of the students at the time, now uh, one is his PhD, how they were feeling it on campus as well. So it added our narrative sharing circle in there. Then we move to our decision point for data analysis. And we drew from Leslie Bartlett's work, which was about a comparative case study. And some of it really speaks to the critical and indigenous nature that we had chosen for our approach. What we appreciated here, and this may speak to some of the scholars that are listening, is uh, that the historical is as present as the contemporary. It's not bounded. And I'm sure you're like, what? Case study is always bounded. That's the hallmark of case study. It's bounded. With Leslie's work, it's not bounded. When you talk about colonization and taking of land and institutions on indigenous land, that's very present as well as historical. It connects together. It's not bounded and it's very, very present for a lot of students. And as a white person, it's needs to be present for me as well. 
So how do we, you know, so this is the approach that we use. I think there's a number of scholars in the United States who use this approach in particular with slavery and Black Lives Matter and the contemporary and the historical as connected. So this is a methodological approach that might allow you to kind of get at some of the things that are of interest to you. So I want to hear from you. I've been talking quite a bit. So I know Stacy has a poll for you about data collection. And so I want to ask you to answer the question, what are your favorite ways to collect data, stories, photos, and um, all that? What have you used that go beyond do no harm? In a poll, we can only say a few uh, options. So if you use other, please feel free to put it in the chat because Stacy can see everybody's. We can't see each other's, but Stacy will take a look and uh, share those with us in a second. So um, I'll give you all a minute to fill this out. Stacy, do you have access to do this? Yes, I'm doing it oh. as people are doing the poll. You might not be able to see it. I'm going, I'll show the results in two seconds. I'm just going to let it get up to about 75 at least we're almost there great so, yeah. thank you for participating everybody i think this is the exciting part i want to you know where we get to hear from you all about what are the things that you use that has been really impactful all right so i'm going to close it and i'll show and i'll share it on the screen so everyone should be able to see the results can you see the results penny i can't it might be okay I'll, I'll read them i think people should be able so for um interviews we had 62 percent for focus groups 16 percent photographs five percent journals six percent and other ten percent and then people wrote in the chat for other critical ethnography ethnographic participant observations interactions uh therapy conversations news media outlets, um, digital so far. Love it, love it. Mm -hmm. Thank you for taking the time, Stacey, to share those ideas because I know I couldn't, I only had a, four options. Yeah. So I know. Yeah, only, yeah, ethnography, I know, I was like, oh, please, I hope somebody brings it up because that's so important. And the uh, therapy conversations, the digital, all these pieces are just wonderful examples of how you can, actually do data collection, right? And so I wanted to also provide uh, some references for you. I think we think of interviews, but there's so many different types of interviews, right? Open and closed, all those things. But also there's interviews when people are, are walking, walking interviews that have been more and more prevalent. Postmodern focus groups, I've done it, sister circles, making a meal together and then recording with uh, the conversation as people are making a meal together. There's different ways to actually do interviews, performance, ethnography, and um, asking people to actually do a performance. Tammy Spry, Johnny Saldana, uh, and uh, Bryant Keith Alexander, amazing scholars who do a lot of performance ethnography. Uh, drawings, as well as I, I'm a student in adult learning who ended up using tarot cards and asking people to pick from certain tarot cards to describe how they were feeling. Amy Davenport did research really that ask people to draw their experience first and then use that as the basis for the interview. Uh, critical co-constructed autoethnographic journals or other ways. There's just so many ideas out there that you don't have to stick with the dominant. You can make a change. And for the scholars who really need to see that it's been done before, there is a lot out there for you to draw upon. So. I also want to give you another tangible example for data collection. So I worked with Mark Chesler and with Al Young on their faculty diversity research project. It was faculty award winners for teaching around diversity in the 
hard sciences and in the social sciences and humanities across the university. They then interviewed all the faculty about, well, how did you do this? What's going on? You know, how do you address issues of diversity in your class to have won this award? And so it was intentionally designed so the interviewer and the interviewee were of different races. And then the last question in the interview was, so if I was of your same identity, would this interview have been different? And I was one of the grad students who did the interviews. And let me tell you, people were like, oh, yes. If you were Latina, let me tell you, here is what I would have, it would have been a whole different interview. And wow, I have to think about that and what that means. Yes, it would have been different for a few people who said no, but by and large, it was a, a, another aspect of the research that really added richness to what we were trying to go after. Another example for uh, data collection was a collectively kept diary of women and women identified humans who collect, who were leaders across the country and then they kept this diary collectively over a decade so that's another way it doesn't always have to be one person's diary that we we think of so um decision points data analysis so we just talked about data collection now i'm going to ask you to do another poll about uh, quote unquote data analysis. So what are the ways in which, Stacey will do the poll, it's open for you, that you use methods. And I connected these methods to grounded theory, to phenomenology, That, but I also realize sometimes people do basic thematic analysis or you let in vivo do the analysis and run a frequency count. So this is hard because there's only a couple choices, but please write in the chat and share ideas that you have or that you've used that have been helpful for you. Penny, it's running now, so I'm just waiting for people to finish voting and then I'll share it. Thanks, Stacy, mm -hmm. And thanks everybody for sharing. I think this is really important to hear from each other. Almost there, just going to give it a little more time and then I'll close it. Great. Okay, so I'll share the poll. So I'll, I'll read off a discourse analysis, 17% grounded theory methods, 26% phenomenological methods, 11% narrative inquiry methods, 31% and other 14% um, and I'll read the other. So Braun and Clark reflexive thematic analysis, uh, thematic using chat and um, expansive theory. Um, and uh, one comment was it depends on the methodology and design and, yes. and the situation. Yes, yes. So, and I will stop sharing now. Hi. Thank you. you. Thank you. You're so right. It does. It depends on the design and the methodological approach that you picked, right? So there are so many different ways. And so when we're thinking about your research question, your collection, your analysis now from a critical advocacy approach, what are some options? And um, let me share some examples. So again, SAGE handbook and SAGE uh, publication. Uh, Adele has chapters in um, SAGE handbook as well as um, this piece here. Her work with postmodern approach to grounded theory is about it's really useful if you're talking about movements. So the hashtag Me Too movement, Black Lives Matter, uh, Matter movement, and big grassroots movements are often so messy, right? And how do you really capture that? So part of what she walked you through are messy maps and then ordered maps or power maps where you're paying attention to issues of power in your analysis in an intentional way. Uh, but then along comes uh, Michelle Salazar Perez, who I really appreciate. She does K-12 work, which is not my wheelhouse. It is early childhood work. After Katrina, she worked with the school communities and 
really talked with legislators, drove community members to community meetings with legislators to talk about and complain about what was going on in the schools. This is what's going on for us, and this is a problem. And so if you're interested in this approach, definitely take a look at some of Michelle's work, Gail Canella, Lavanya Bennett and I are working on some work with insidious trauma from a counseling perspective, which is Lavanya's area as well. COVID slowed down, of course, you know. Um, but here are examples of these mess messy maps, the ways in which Adele Clark or Lavanya and I have taken all the different ideas that were there. And I um, was able to do this with Adele at one point when she was working with a group of uh, people where you are taking all the concepts, writing it down, circling them in different colors, drawing them together. Here's a theme. This is how do you take this messiness and move it to an ordered space where then you can start to put it on the page, which is very didactic, right? So how to move it from there. Uh, one of my new favorite books, as some of my students know, is this, uh, The Activist Academic, Engaged Scholarship for Resistance, Hope, and Social Change. And they have a new methodological approach, which is critical co-constructed autoethnography, which is really about a dialogic space. And that dialogic space is where that analysis will come from regarding issues of oppression, solidarity, indifference in terms of their different identities. So that's another tangible example for you. Another one that I hope is a, that you all use is a new approach, which is intersectional methodology. So uh, uh, Shayla uh, and colleagues have done a great job with this new approach that really takes Black women intersectional methodology and talks about these four strategies that then you can use in your methods for data analysis as you go forward. So if this fits for you, please consider taking a look at their new published piece. Another example, early career scholar, I worked with Moira Ozias on critical discourse analysis, so Foucault and questioning issues of power with critical geography. And I want to just point out, it's a lot of words, but critical geography has been explored as a theoretical framework, a methodology, or simply reduced to methods. And so you can find critical geography in all of these different approaches, or as we did kind of thread it together. And so um, I th uh, Veronica Velez is somebody else who uses critical mapping in exciting ways for you with your analysis. So I know I'm watching the time and I just wanted to mention, uh, how can I talk about making decisions and critical advocacy research without really talking about positionality and who you are and the dangers that can happen if you don't interrogate your own identity and work collaboratively and learn from as gifts that come to you from people that you're working with, right? So um, Rich Milner's work, as well as he, Lori Patton Davis, and I have, uh, he presented in our uh, series on unapologetic educational research and then we dialogue about this topic and I'll just quickly talk about um, there's seen dangers where it's explicit and you can see it unseen where it's hidden covert and you can't necessarily see it some of the work I did was about women people of color community partners grad students their voices are silenced on the side of policy conversations not okay, not a surprise, but needs to be interrupted and overturned. And on uh, unforeseen dangers. So this can be very dangerous if you're working in communities. So I wanna encourage you to take a look at his work. Bricolage is another concept about pulling together different methods from different methodological approaches. And you draw from these different methods and put it together, but I think Joe Kitzlow's approach is one that really is about being intentional from a critical standpoint and not just pushing them together. What does it mean to be a critical pedagogical scholar and do critical qualitative work? And again, a sage book. So um, congruence, 
matters. We've been talking about congruence this whole time. And so here's a book and a video that sometimes for your classes, I know videos are important for YouTube videos that really talks about congruence and why it's so important. So dissemination, I'm watching the time and I think we'll forego this um, last poll, but I did want to mention that dissemination matters. Actually taking the work that you're doing, not having it sit on a shelf, putting it out to communities. And so certainly when I was trained, it was like, you do journal publications, you need tenure. But that same study you wanna make sure is in a practitioner magazine and an op-ed. So there was this three pronged approach to your publications. But what about policy briefs? Policymakers tend to make decisions without necessarily the information that you know. How hard is it to put together a one to two pager and get it to the policymakers or to work with your college to make sure that there's a stream of policy briefs that get from your faculty to legislators or community members, community newsletters, flipping authorship. So your community partner is first author and you're last on the newsletter, getting out, out to blogs, social media, of course, working with and speaking to multiple constituencies really does matter. It gets your work out there. So I know we're all busy, but saying yes to some of the invitations is important. Reflexivity is intervention. You have to have a commitment. I have to have a commitment to constantly work on myself. Things change, ideas change. I, cha I have to be always educating and reflecting on my own decisions, acknowledging when I mess up, it's gonna happen, and how to make sure that that is not okay, and that I continue to do the reflexive work needed as well as the action. And socialization of new scholars, putting it in your classes, also making sure that your health and your rejuvenation matters. So Carmen McCallum did a video on working with traumatized populations and qualitative research that might be of interest to you um, in terms of talking about this. But all your decisions matter. Every single decision you make matters in terms of your work. So Qualab, here's our website, and we're, I mentioned the Unapologetic Educational Research Series that we're doing, Mark, uh, Malik Kenfield, uh, that conversation is coming up soon, but let me stop and ask about questions and just engage with you for the rest of the time. I'm going to stop and turn it over to Stacy. Great. Uh, thank you, Penny. That was really, really good. Um, I'm going to have, uh, Ali has the first question for you. Ali, if you want to go ahead. Sure. Uh, Mariano has asked, with the systemic cultural and racial discrimination, how do you think culturally responsive research could improve its contribution to making political discourse culturally responsive? Yes. So political discourse, how can this make a difference? And so it's, I have to say it's so layered. Yes, yes, we need to be there in terms of figuring out what's going on, right? So I think as we talked about earlier, not just observing where oppression is happening in the political discourse, what's going on in terms of the political discourse, doing the analysis, but actually taking that, disseminating it, making sure that we're engaged as community members. I think Michelle Salazar Perez is, is a good example here, where she actually picked up community members, was driving people around. You as a scholar can be engaged politically. It no longer is really where you have to observe from far away and not be involved. Of course, some scholars do that. I'm, you know, you have to pick what's right for you. But as a researcher, it's okay to be engaged in the community and the political protest and then work with understand what's going on the complexities i think choosing methodological approaches and analysis processes that help you really interrogate issues of power and oppression and hierarchy hegemony and how it's operating so that that way you can really have new information we know it's bad we know it's tough what's going on but how to really get in there and have these findings and get it into the people's hands that make legislative change or develop programs for uh 
for communities, whether it's about food banks or whether it's about home people homeless and making sure that people are engaged, youth and homeless youth, making sure that we're getting it to policy program uh, people who are making a difference in the community and working collaboratively, that dissemination and engagement matters. I hope I answer the question, but I think it's so important. And so I think, yes, please do this work. It's so needed. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, here's another question. Uh, what strategies have you employed to tone down some professors who tend to pontificate to co-researchers who are practitioners and community members and community-driven research projects? Ah, yes. So I think I, there, I've got a couple scenarios in my head. One is I am the scholar. I'm going to pontificate about how you're supposed to do it. And this is the right way, right? Versus somebody who's engaged as a practitioner, knows how to do the work, is living and breathing the work. And it's that ivory tower conversation, right? So that uh, crux or uh, the dissonance that's happening between somebody who really knows the work and somebody who thinks they know the day-to-day -day work. Um, but then, hey, I know the research, so it's gonna, possibly clash and how do you operate in in those conversations i, I think um there's it, so it's situational back to the person who wrote about uh you know it matters what methodological approach i i pick up i think people matter and just like research is local research is different if i'm in a local community in ohio or if i'm in Ka on the island of Kauai, right it matters Re so research is going to change even if it's somewhat similar research design same thing with the interactions how do you actually interrupt and that pattern that becomes so familiar for faculty and practitioners i know the work and you know, wait a minute, how do I infuse, right? I think sometimes with those conversations, your knowledge matters and how do you get the other person to hear what's going on or value your knowledge? So as a, I'm somebody who is a practitioner for a number of years before I went back and got my PhD. And I have to say what I said before my PhD and after might've been the same, but once I had the PhD, people heard it differently right so um not okay how do you make sure that that voice is being heard in different spaces and that you interrupt patterns so sometimes i think pointed questions to the person who's pontificating that really get that person to analyze their approach is helpful so having those questions that kind of derail that process or that uh, pattern is helpful. Asking that person to actually reflect. Sometimes those conversations happen in a large group. Sometimes they happen one-on-one -on, -one on the outside over, I feel like you're not valuing the practitioners in the room. And this is a group that has great value and information. How do we center their voices and asking that person to then take agency in trying to center it? I think there's, again, it's local, it's different depending on who they are and the players. I also know sometimes you're trying to get through a dissertation and that person has power on your dissertation committee. So paying attention to those things as well and not always being hard on yourself if you choose to keep your job or keep your dissertation, put food on the table for your family, right? How do you pay attention to issues of power and address it when you can? And know that sometimes you can't, but hopefully some of those reflective questions and um, getting that person to do the work that you're hoping that they can do uh, is, is helpful. I'm going to just stop there and um, hopefully I answer the question, but I think Stacy too and Allie, if you have ideas or thoughts, please add them. Um, uh, th the participant who wrote that question said, I, I, tried, I tried turning them on to Brookfield. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. And um and Ali has another question for you. Yes, sorry, I was having trouble with my microphone for a second. Um 
Penny, would you be able to share any insights about how culturally responsive research can be approached through quantitative studies? And that is a question that I'm finding is coming up quite a bit in my own work as well. Yes, yes. Thank you for that question. So there's a debate out there, which I think we're past the paradigm wars. We're better, we're better, you know, like I hope we're past the paradigm wars. And so there also is a debate about can there really be critical quantitative scholars? And some of my call, my uh, colleagues, Sylvia Hurtado is a good example, argue absolutely yes. Um, Derek Houston is another. Whereas quantitative scholars, they're going beyond just instead of all the white people getting coded as zero and then all the other people getting coded as one, you know, so that you center the zero one um, instead of, it, Yes, doing things like that. How are you coding? But also they're taking it further in terms of the questions and the work that they're doing. I um, often share, so Sylvia Hurtado, some of her quantitative work was in front of the US Supreme Court with Pat Gurren and Jerry Gurren, Eric Dye, about affirmative action in colleges and universities. So I studied colleges and universities. I think you probably didn't got that. But um, their, their quantitative work really was one of the deciding factors for Sandra Day O'Connor when she was still on the court to say diversity in admissions is still needed. Is still race is still a determining fact needs to be a determining factor in terms of admissions. Hopefully we won't need it eventually, but at the present moment we still do need it. And and so it was their quant work that really was the deciding factor for Sandra Day O'Connor. So I think there's ways in which quantitative work is so important and really can speak to uh, legislators in the sense. I think also, um, as I mentioned with the zero one, there's ways in which to do the analysis, to ask the questions you ask makes a difference. Researcher reflexivity in quantitative research matters, but it's often not talked about. Now I think more than before, but it was always something, oh, that's light and squishy with qualitative, which is not the case. It's very rigorous. There's as some of the qualitative work people know. It's very rigorous and a lot. And quantitative as well has its the ability to really pay attention to researcher positionality. The survey questions you're developing, working on research questions with community members. Are you doing that? How do you take it through a quantitative research design from beginning to end? Who's on your research team? Who decides your research questions? How do you really take that survey and work it on it with a community instead of just assuming what is going on. Maybe everybody can't read English because English is their second or third language, right? So how are you paying attention to the community that you're working with? And I think there's important ways all the way through the design that you could be asking. And it's this kind of work is not one and done, qual or quant or mixed methods, historical. It's more than one is done, one and just one and done. So how to make sure it's really infused every step of the way is important. I could probably say more, but um, Allie, do you think that is helpful or? Um... Yeah, I think so. I mean, I'd invite more people to ask questions or follow-ups and we're happy to throw them over to Penny. Um, I mean, one thing that's come up from my perspective too is that particularly with COVID and all of the geospatial data that's being mapped and thinking about the context and how you are writing about that, how you're visualizing that. And like you were saying, Penny, really being aware of your own researcher biases or kind of predilections that you're bringing into something when you're developing those systems. And I think it's something that people are hyper aware of, but then in working on data visualization books and looking at some of the maps, it's abundantly clear that this is designed with kind of one demographic in mind and not thinking about the language or the color schemes or what the context behind that data is and how important it is to contextualize and position the data. Yes, yes. I 
I mentioned Veronica Velez uh, before, I think it's Washington State, um, is somebody who's really taking a look at mapping data visualization in new critical innovative ways and is a quantitative scholar and now doing a little more qualitative work. But the mapping, as you're talking about, Allie, is, is central for her. So I'd encourage people to, to look up some of her work. Uh, thank you, um, and we have, oh, I think, time for one more question, and before I do that, I'm just going to uh, show some of the other webinars that are coming up um, uh, with the SAGE, uh, SAGE webinar series and in vivo, so we have one with qualitative research and innovation, uh, and you can register with this link. Also, we have um, five more in the culturally responsive research webinars, so please um, feel free to register and we send a recording if you can't make the date or time check out the Unvivo podcast and at the end you'll get a quick survey um, and it asks would you like to uh, be part of the Unvivo community if you say yes I'll just send you a little information and then you'll get updates on these types of uh, uh, programs but the last question here um, is uh, Dr. Pasque thank you for your thoughtful talk as a journal um, editor, could you say more about strategies junior scholars can employ to navigate getting their culturally responsive and critical research through the high impact factor positivist framing of today's publishing pipeline? Great question. So I, as you mentioned in the intro, Stacy, I'm one of the editors for the review of higher ed, high impact factor for our field, right? It varies by field and dif discipline, but uh, that and the research that I showed about positivism is really what gets published more often when you look at empirical studies on that. Um, topic. So you're taking up this approach, but you need tenure. You want to get it out there to the field so the field can take a look at the important work you're doing. But if these are the gatekeepers, that matters. So I think paying attention to who's on editorial boards is important. So for our journal, for example, there's me as a qualitative scholar and then Tom who's a quantitative scholar and so that kind of signals to the audience that now we're accepting more qualitative pieces than what has been done in the past that's a part of why I was with another journal and brought in as a senior associate editor and you know all that so I think pay, also paying attention to who's on the um, on the uh, entire board because this is the group that might be reading your article. So if they have pieces that they think were is connected to to uh, advocacy work and to some of the social justice work that we're talking about here, culturally responsive research, you want to make sure that you're including that. You want to make sure you're citing that journal, that you're centering that, that you're citing the people who might be reviewing because they think that they've done this work. And so maybe they have, but it's not you know, it's prominent or in the top tier journal. Maybe theirs is in a smaller journal. You just don't know, right? So you want to make sure that you're paying attention to that. You also, I think, doing your homework and doing the work for the reader. Think about the editors and the reviewers who are reading your work but have never heard of a walking interview before, who have never heard about doing an analysis that is more emergent. I don't know, you know, like these are people who might not know what postmodernism or critical work is and might be only familiar with the positivistic, post-positivistic work. So I think making sure when we talked about bricolage, uh, making sure that your citations are uh, congruent and matching, but that you're educating the reader so that they know you've done your work and that this is as rigorous, because it is, I swear it is as rigorous as anything else, it's just different. So you have to educate that reader. Look at the journal. How do people set the problem statement, engage the reader? There's, It's a kind of formulaic, right? Which I think can be problematic. So if you're starting with a narrative story, what are the journals that have already published where they start with a narrative story? Uh, what are the journals that tend not to do that? So how do you then put the story a little bit later? 
in terms of that piece. How do you kind of match that approach, but also you do the work for the reader. You educate the reader in all the citations and the work that has been done that leads to your important work. And then that way, hopefully they're with you and saying, oh, this person is really pushing it even further with this new work. It's innovative, it's new, we need this in our journal. So I think those are some of the ways I would say to, to really do that work for, for the reader. That, that's great. That's really good information, I think. I just yeah, wanted to yeah. say one quick thing from the perspective of an academic publisher. Um, we're very committed to citational justice. And so I'd encourage people to look at societies like Data and Society and see what kind of work that they're doing. And also just if you are an editor at a journal or if you're writing for a journal, go to the publisher and push back if you encounter any resistance because guaranteed that that's not their intention, but it could be that their review board is not representative. Um, yesterday I was in a session where black academics were talking about how their supervisors were saying their research was self-indulgent because it was just exploring their community and that's just <laughs> major red flag to say the very least. So if you are encountering those kind of comments from peer reviews and you don't know what to do, loop in the publisher, escalate things, talk to your other editors, raise it with more people, get the attention on it, and you'll be able to push through. Yes. Put in that citation that this is not navel gazing. You know, put, <laughs> there are scholars who have written about that. So yes, I, I thank you, Ali, I love it. Thank you. That's great. I think that's a good place to end the the webinar right right on time pretty much but uh thank you so much um dr pasque i think it was really enlightening and people i can tell by the comments really got a lot out of it uh so we just want to thank you and i thank ali too thanks stacy thanks penny and thank you everyone for listening thank have you a good so day much. everyone yeah bye bye bye